Hello friends, my name is George Lernis and I am extremely excited to be here today uh, presenting uh, to you my workshop at the uh, Danilo Perez Foundation. So um, first I'm going to share my screen and I will um, begin the presentation. So my presentation is called Middle Eastern and Mediterranean music meets jazz. And um, my hope through this uh, workshop is not only to introduce you to my culture, you know, growing up uh, in the Middle East, uh, specifically Cyprus, but also talk about my experiences as an immigrant in the US coming from the Middle East and also my approach um, introducing my roots and traditions into my music these days, which is actually what I'm really interested in, is it jazz. So to begin, I'm going to uh, uh, talk a little bit about uh, my background. So I am originally from Cyprus, Nicosia, Cyprus. And um, Cyprus is, a, is an island in, in the Mediterranean Sea. And that's where I was born and raised. Um, growing up in Cyprus, I was introduced to traditional percussion in an early age, you know, and uh, also got exposed to the music of the Middle East in an early age. Uh, growing up in Cyprus, of course, even though, uh, you know, I might have been more into jazz those days, uh, in, in the background, in TV uh, and the radio, I always, um, I was exposed to this music. So many times, even though we don't seek to learn something, uh, you know, at, at the time, and, but we are exposed to the sounds, you know, later on in life, if we go back, it's embedded in, in our head, in our DNA, so it's easy to bring it out. So at an early age, I got interested in drum set. I, it was uh, when I saw a live performance of a fantastic drummer in Cyprus uh, playing that I got interested uh, in learning the drums and I, I had my mother sign me up for a lesson and I started learning the drums and particularly jazz, right? So at that time I was, uh, learning a lot about Charlie Parker, Miles Davis, drummers such as Tony Williams. But at the same time, I got interested uh, in percussion. So I was uh, experimenting with a percussion instrument known as a darbuka, wh which we're going to be talking about today. So eventually, um, I was able to move to the US uh, to study at the prestigious College of Music. I was accepted and moved to the US. And uh, there I studied jazz performance for four years. So this was an important time in my life because I studied with great masters and musicians at Berkeley and learned a lot and matured as a musician. And um, what happened is uh, right after graduating from Berkeley, as I was maturing as a musician, as I just said, um, I got interested in, in my cultures and traditions. I started reading books about the history of my island, Cyprus, and the history of the Middle East. And, uh, and started learning instruments such as the frame drum, the rec, the derbuka, all drums that we were going to touch base during this workshop. And a better, uh, deeper appreciation of my cultures. This is very important. important. Uh, I realized growing up that it's very important to appreciate our cultures and make sure that we incorporate a lot of our sounds and traditions to whatever we're doing these days. So eventually I also uh, did my master's degree in Boston, Massachusetts and uh, from a different school, Longe School of Music. And my master's was also on jazz performance. But at this point in my life, uh, percussion um, was present in my playing. I always, um, you know, uh, introduced percussion instruments and melodies from the Middle East into my playing compositions. I, so, so my culture at this point of my career was more present into my music and my art. So in the U.S. I had the great opportunity to, st to study with a lot of greats like uh, Bob Gulodi, John Hazila, Jamie Haddad, but also had the opportunity throughout my life to travel because of uh, touring and performing. And because of these travels, I always took advantage of it when I was in the Middle East to study with masters, percussion instrument master, masters, right? Uh, that, that taught me a lot. Uh, 
So these days I, uh, I recorded with people like Dave Liebman in the U.S., uh, Annette Cohen, Antonio Sanchez. Uh, I played with a lot of big bands like the uh, What's Next big band that I played percussion with. Um, I also have a few of my own groups. Uh, one particular one is called the Faros Ensemble that we uh, play the music of the Asian minor regions. And during my second workshop, we're going to have a sp two special guests that are part of this ensemble. But one of the special guests, Rini Tornesaki, is actually, um, her family comes from the Asian minor regions, and she will be talking about that as well. So having said that, uh, I would love to um, play for you uh, a small composition of mine. This is about five minutes. I'm going to stop it because it's longer than that. But we're going to watch like five minutes. And this is a, a percussion solo I composed uh, last summer and recorded. And it's basically incorporated, uh, incorporating uh, a lot of percussion instruments um, from the Middle East and Mediterranean regions, but as well as Indian influences and African influences. I, I highly recommend since we're not going to be watching the whole thing, go to YouTube and, and uh, type Parallel Universes by George Lernis and watch the whole thing. Uh, and um, and uh, I hope you enjoy. So let's watch this video.
here we go. So I hope you enjoyed that. Uh, in that video, I'm, I'm incorporating uh, different drums and we're going to be throughout these three workshops. My, my goal is to introduce all of those drums and talk about the uh, basics, drum strokes and uh, history of the drums as well. And uh, some of the drums I used in that video, for example, is the rec, the uh, little uh, tambourine with the cymbals, uh, the frame drum different kinds of frame drums, and the darbuka, which is a goblet-shaped drum, uh, and then um, also some gongs. Those are thigh gongs, and uh, it, my inspiration was actually gamelan music. So I put these little pentatonic scales, scale with gongs that I incorporated for the second movement. And it's worth mentioning that that composition was uh, all free improvisation, even though I had structure, for example, I had an idea for each section. For example, the first section, I had a Tihai idea that I, I was singing as well. Um, and then for the second section, I had a little gong pattern that I developed my solos over. And then for the third section, again, I had uh, some smaller Indian ideas that uh, I developed my solos around. So next, I would like to talk about my country, Cyprus, uh, which is uh, the country you see here. It's, a, it's an island in the Mediterranean Sea. I am from Nicosia, Cyprus, here in, in the middle, in the heart of the island. You can see it says Nicosia. And uh, Cyprus has a very rich history that we're going to talk a little bit about, uh, because when we are dealing with music, it's important to understand history, right? Uh, especially to understand the flavors of, our, of the music and the, uh, you know, that we get. So let's move to the next slide. Uh, this is a bigger map, uh, and here we can see Cyprus. It's this little country right here, just below Turkey, on the south uh, side of Turkey, southeast side of Greece, and then on the north side of Egypt. And it's important uh, to show you the location uh, uh, of Cyprus because uh, o o during uh, over the history, a lot of major empires ruled Cyprus. Everyone wanted to control Cyprus because of the location. You see how it's located in the middle of major continents, right? Everyone wanted to have control of Cyprus. It's just a fantastic location. So Cyprus been uh, under many hands. So let's talk a little bit about the history of the island now. So the first Neolithic settlements in Cyprus can be dated to 7000 BC. Between the 1500s and 1000 BC, uh, first the uh, Hittites and, and then the Egyptians controlled the island. Also during this period, uh, the first uh, Mycenaean Greeks began to settle there. And, and since then, uh, the island been through many hands. For example, the Assyrians, the Egyptians, the Persians, the Roman Empire, the Om uh, Roman Empire, the Ottoman Empire, the Byzantine Empire, and England. So it's been under the control of many empires. In 1924, Cyprus was placed fully under British administration, leading to the establishment of an independent by communal republic of Cyprus in 1960. This is a very important time in the history of the island because during that time we had three communities living in the island in harmony and peace. Also uh, communities with different religions. So this is very important, right? So we had the Greek um, Cypriots, which was actually the majority of the population. Then we had the Turkish Cypriots, which also was a large majority of the population. And then we had a smaller population of Armenian Cypriots. And of course, it's worth mentioning the religions too, because when we get into music, these things matter, you know, like the, the flavors we're getting. It's just so we know, like the Greek Cypriots were mostly uh, Christian Orthodox, and we also had uh, the Turkish Cypriots, a lot of them were Muslims. Uh, Unfortunately, in 1974, there was a war in the island that divided the country in two. Uh, I'm not going to get into the politics of why it happened, because this is a music workshop, but it's important to know that in 1974, there was a, a war that uh, split the population, it basically forced all of the Greek Cypriots to move to the south and all of the Turkish Cypriots to move to the north. So if, you're, so if you were a Turkish Cypriot that owned a house in the south, you were forced to, to abandon everything and go to the north. And same thing happened for Greek Cypriots that lived in the north. They were forced to leave their houses and move to the south. 
And up to this day, unfortunately, we have a green line and the island is separated in the north and the south and it's uh, very unfortunate. Um, so let's get into music. So I'm going to play for you a traditional song uh, from Cyprus and I picked this particular song because it's a bilingual song. Uh, because of the history of the island, I thought it's the best way to approach this is to play a song that's sung in both in Greek and Turkish. So the, I think the first version is in Turkish and then it goes into a Greek verse. And uh, this is uh, for an ensemble that I actually play with, the Duni Ensemble, and the, uh, the, uh, it, it says Mehmet Ali Sanlikol, it's his group. Um, so please enjoy. <laughs> Dem gözlü bir yarı senin kendiniden geçti Wonderful. Um, so let me go out of this, uh, get out of this slide, and uh, and uh, talk about what we heard. So that was a traditional, actually, uh, a song from Cyprus. So we have uh, actually our, our our own style in Cyprus, and uh, also we have our own flavors because the island um, uh, has been uh, been uh, under so many different, you know, emperors like the Venetians, the Romans. Um, uh, the Byzantine Empire, we have many influences, right? And we can hear that uh, in, uh, in our music. So, in this song we heard uh, uh, the, the traditional instrumentation uh, uh, in Cyprus, which is actually violin, darbuka, and laudo. I, I have a picture of laudo as well in the next slide, but for example, this picture right here, we can see um, uh, uh, three musicians, a uh, blind vi violinist. This was a famous uh, blind violinist from the north, Turkish Cypriot. His group was called uh, the Mehmet Talier Ensemble. So we see the violin, which is uh, a very popular instrument in the history of Cyprus, and the darbuka, this drum on the, the right person, that's uh, on the person on the right is playing the darbuka, goblet-shaped drum. And then we see also a type of tambourine. We call it the uh, daf, also daharas. Rek has many names in the Middle East. So this instrument right here is the other instrument in that recording. is the lauto. It's a type of lute, right? And we see that it has four strings. There, each string is doubled, and uh, each string is tuned in an oct in an octave, right? And once again, this is a type of lute, and this was an accompanying instrument. So uh, in the music of Cyprus and the music of the Middle East in general, uh, lauto uh, has the role of an accompaniment instrument traditionally, meaning it drives like a percussion instrument. It plays the rhythm, right? And basic, you know, like chords, but nothing fancy. It usually plays like maybe a fifth, but uh, mostly driving. And uh, the role of the violin, of course, is uh, to play the melody and the microtones and the role of the percussionist to also drive and settle the groove. So what are some of the characteristics uh, of the music of Cyprus and the music of the Middle East and the Mediterranean regions in general? So 
I think there's uh, five things I came up with that are very characteristic of our music. And of, the first thing is the add time rhythms. And this is uh, not, not the song was in a two, of course, we can hear the song being in even time, but the majority of the rhythms in the Middle East is like 90%, I would say it's add time. So we have a lot of songs in five, seven, nine, 10, 11, you name it. We have a lot of add time rhythms, but we also on occasion have rhythms such as the one we just heard which is called Sirtos, that's an even rhythm. Another characteristic of our music is the microtones, right? We have a lot of, um, uh, we use microtones in our scales. So scales, we call them makams, right? Makam is a mode, and that's how we refer to the different modes. We're going to cover makams in this workshop as well. Um, Another thing is uh, all of this music is dance music, very much like uh, Latin American music and African music. All of these rhythms are actually dances, right? And it's very important for musicians uh, when we're growing up in Cyprus and uh, they teach us to pay attention closely to the feet of the dancers, right? Because you're meant, this is an experience for, for the dancers and the musicians have to be mindful of that, right? So it's all dance music. Uh, also, our music in general, I would characterize it as uh, horizontal music. Uh, the, the example we just heard has some sense of, you know, chords, but in general, the music of the Middle East, Mediterranean region is horizontal music, meaning it's mostly melodic. We don't have so much harmonization, right? And you might wonder how, how does that work? How do you make music interesting if you have just melody? And I think it goes back to the microtones, right? So musicians like uh like violinist violinist uh, oud players uh, laud players uh, there's a type of laud actually that's fretless it's called lafta this particular one we saw is actually with frets and it's mostly for driving but uh, usually um instrument players uh spend huge amount of their lives learning the microtones and learning the macams the modes and they they master this right and the 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 microtones is what makes our music like special it's 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 our secret sauce right it's like if if we talk about jazz for example and we take out the harmony and the chords it's like eating a burger without cheese right you just have the melody but when you add when you add the uh the chords and it, it, it becomes you know you get an extra layer right you get you get the full picture of, of the sound same thing for our music because we don't have the harmony we have the microtones and the mastery of these microtones is very important because the uh, the players like the wood player is uh, is, is uh, they have certain ways going upwards like playing certain microtones and going downward motions different microtones and their master and their subtleties make our music special um, another thing is the emphasis on lyrics all of this music mostly at least has lyrics right and uh, many love songs uh, wedding songs uh, you know uh, lots of history poems you know our mu most of our music has lyrics so the next thing right here we see is the instrument note as a darbuka. This is a goblet shaped drum. And you might be thinking djembe, you're absolutely right. The African djembe is also a goblet shaped drum. So, uh, and these, these are ancient drums, really. You know, we know that they date back to the 1100 uh, BC at least, you know. And traditionally speaking, these drums were made of natural skin like usually goat, if it was smaller um, uh, diameter drums, they would make them with fish too, but high, a little bit more unusual, mostly goat, I would say. In Africa, it's worth mentioning that djembe is usually, I believe, made by uh, deer skin. Um, this name has many different names uh, throughout the world, right? And uh, like we said, in Africa, they call it the djembe. In the Middle East, we call it the derbuka, the dumbek, uh, tumberleki, tombak, has many, many names. So I'm going to demonstrate this uh, drum and talk a little bit. So we're going to watch this uh, short video. Hello, friends. Today I'm going to be talking to you about this beautiful drum uh, that we uh, know as the Derbuka in the Middle East. Uh, of course, it has um, many different names from region to region. For example, uh, the, we can call this a Tuberleki or a Dumbek. Uh, also, one thing you might notice is the shape of the drum. This is a goblet-shaped drum, and you might be thinking Jembe which is, it's actually, Jembe is also a goblet chain drum. 
and uh, djembe is an African drum uh, and uh, the difference between the djembe and the derbuka is uh, the way we play. In Africa when they play the djembe they play it in the middle of their feet like this. In our part of the world we play it uh, like lap style like this. So um, that's one uh, difference. Uh, however there's a lot of similarities too. For example both djembe and this drum are made of uh, natural skin. Uh, in my case, this is goat. I think uh, Jembe has uh, thicker skins, but um, we use, usually you'll find this with goat, but if it's a smaller drum, you'll also find them with fish skin. Uh, these days they sell these drums with synthetic skins. However, traditionally speaking, they were definitely made with natural skins. And also I think the sound quality is much better if you have a natural skin on the drum than a synthetic skin. The other thing to keep in mind, is that if you look closely, there there are ropes here. It's a uh, it's tuned with ropes, um, and another similarity with the djembe, right? But uh, in our regions too, they glue it on the clay just for um, to keep the tuning consistent. With djembe, it's mostly rope tuned, and then they adjust the ropes to um, they they stretch stretch the ropes to tune the drum. So now let's talk about the strokes, the three basic strokes of this drum. And it's worth mentioning that uh, in the Middle East, when we refer to these strokes, we have names, right, for each stroke. For example, the, our bass stroke, we call it Dum, D-U-M. Uh, if you um, look into like Indian music, like tablas, you know, tabla players also use uh, names for each stroke. So it's very much the same concept. In our case, when we play the bass uh, tone, uh, the Dum, we call it um, the bass uh, stroke, we call it the Dum. Uh, how do we produce the doom? Uh, it's basically a flat hand and we hit around this area. So my two soft parts of my hand touch the rim. You see this rim? Now, if, if you're familiar with congas, you're gonna, you probably know how to play the bass stroke in the middle of the drum. However, with these drums, we get better bass if we are actually back here more like an open tone. The next stroke I'm going to be showing you is the path sound, right? And this is like a slap. However, I, I tend to um, I, I tend to avoid calling it the slap because slap is sharp, right, on a conga. And on these drums, the path sound is a little more. It's crunchy, but it's not so sharp, right? But the technique is similar. We curve our fingers a little bit, and we get a close sound. So I think. Derbuka, like pa sound, is uh, something between a muffled tone and a slap on a conga, you know, so this kind of sound. The last drum I'm going to be showing you is the tech. And to get a tech sound, we play at the very edge of the drum with the tips of our finger. Right? And the way I'm producing this sound is by, with my right hand, I hit my, my, my ring finger and my middle finger together on the very edge. And with my left hand, I hit with my index fingers, finger going downwards, and then coming up with my ring finger um, upwards, right? So let's do this experiment. Let's clap together in nine and I'll play a little bit. So we're gonna play a rhythm in nine. The ostinato goes like this. One, two, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, clap with me. So that was a demonstration of uh, the Darbuka drum and the rhythm I played uh, at the end actually it's a Karchila Mas rhythm, that's what we call that rhythm in uh, in Greece, it's a rhythm in nine and actually in Turkey they call it the Karchila Mas as well. And uh, I, I encourage you like even if you don't play a Darbuka, um, you should actually practice your stinado and see if you can play 
um, against it or create some rhythm similar to the ones I just played. So next I'd love to teach you also one more uh, rhythm, uh, the rhythm that we heard in the video. The, the video we just heard uh, with, the Greek, uh, with the Cypriot song had this rhythm, the Sirtos, that's what we call this rhythm in Cyprus. But that once again, um, the name only applies to Greece and Cyprus because like if you, in Arabic culture, they call this Malfouf. And this uh, rhythm has many, many names from region to region, country to country. But for the sake of our seminar and the fact that I'm from Cyprus, we're calling it the Sirtus today. So if you look at this rhythm, basically you see like a kind of a clave in it, right? You see the three clave, pa, ka, ka, right? The, like a son three clave. So this is a nice exercise I would encourage you all to do. Just clap in two, one, two, one, and let's sing the rhythm with the syllables, the percussion syllables, like this. One, two, one, two, doom, tick, tick, 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 doom, tick, tick. You could also approach this exercise as a kinesthetic exercise. You can stand up and go left and right and do the same thing, sing it. It's very nice to verbalize these rhythms, to learn them. So let's move to the next slide. So even though this is mostly percussion workshop, I think when we're talking about the music of the Middle East, we have to know what the microtone is, right? And uh, once again, microtones is what makes our music special, right? It's our flavor. It's our secret sauce. So right here we see a little graph I made. And uh, if, if actually, let's, let's try it this way. Let's think of Western music. Let's think of a piano, right? When we're on the piano and we have two notes, the C and the D, Do and Re, that's a major second. It's two notes next to each other, right? But between those two notes, we have one black note. That's the, we can call it the C sharp or the uh, D flat, right? And that's our minor second. So we have between a major second, between the C and the D, we have one black note. Now look at this graph. If we think that C, excuse me, is at the beginning and D at the end, Look at all these little rectangular boxes here. We have one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. We have nine flavors. Think about that. So in our music, like in the regions of Greece and uh, Turkey to be specific, when we talk about microtones, we use this system. And this changes from region to region. Some regions use 12, like the Byzantine traditions use 12, and then Arabs uh, use quarter tones, so less. But in, in, in Cyprus, Turkey, and Greece, we use this, and we have nine flavors. So when we talk about microtones, for example, if you see the sharp sign that we all know of on the, uh, in Western music, that actually, it's not, it, there's, it's not the same as the black note between the C and the D in our case. It's actually four comma sharps, sharp from C, which makes it a little flatter than the, than the C sharp that we know in Western music, right? And then... When you see the regular flat sign just below, that means one comma flat. So if we're saying, if you have a, a note of C and that, uh, that flat sign, it means that that C is going to be one comma flat. But of course that changes from macam to macam, mode to mode. S different modes are supposed to be played more flat or others sharper, right? So it all depends. Let's move to the next slide. I'm going to demonstrate for you um, microtones on this instrument. This is a santor. This is um, actually uh, a, uh, an instrument I'm learning myself. I'm actually a student of this instrument for the last year. And uh, I made a little video explaining the microtone so you can hear it. Let's listen. Okay, let me go back. Hello, friends. So here in front of me, I have an instrument known in the Middle East as a santor. Uh, what it is, it's, uh, it's a dulcimer, it's a type of dulcimer, Middle Eastern dulcimer. And uh, dulcimer, basically we play it with hammers. You see these hammers I hold with my hands and play. So it's technically a percussion instrument. However, this is a special kind of santor. 
because my center uh, was de designed and uh, uh, built by a Turkish um, a luthier that basically added these levers that we call mandals. If you see, there's some little levers here that they can adjust that basically let me play microtones, which are essential for our music, right? And um, we have already talked in the workshop uh, a little bit what microtones sound, but are, but now we can hear them. So for example, let's take a scale like uh, the D major scale, right? That has an F sharp and C sharp. In our part of the world, we call this scale rust, uh, which is the equivalent of a major scale. However, our F sharp is a little flatter than the way we hear it in Western music, meaning that if we think from F, not from F sharp, it's four commas sharp, right? So. In Western music, our F sharp would sound like this. In our region, we like it like this. So, four sharp, four comma sharp from F. So it's flatter than the F sharp that we know. So let me play the D major scale, our rust, the way we would play it. I'll do it slow so you can hear it. Now, you might have noticed that when I go down, when I have an um, upwards motion, I am a little flat. But when I come down, I'm even flatter. So when we're coming down, we drop one more mandal, right? And this is part of the way we play the scale. So now let me play a little something for you to get an idea what this instrument sounds like. And maybe you can hear a little bit of the microtones. Okay, so we just heard um, the uh, the Santur. Uh, that's uh, an instrument I acquired uh, uh, about a year and a half ago, and I started learning myself. And it, it's a it's a difficult learning curve because of the ma uh, microtones and adjusting the mandals as you play. Uh, that we talked about those little levers, and uh, once again uh, we need those little levers so we can play the microtones, where are characteristic uh, for the uh, for this type of music. And um, and it's worth mentioning that some instruments do not dis need this lever. There's fretless instruments as well, like the violin, for example, or or the oud. If if you don't know what the oud is, uh, you should probably Google it. Uh, o U D. It's a traditional instrument again uh, used a lot in the Middle East. That's fretless, and they play microtones on. And one more thing that's worth mentioning before we move on is that uh, once again, from region to region. Uh, microtones can change, right? Like, uh, like, uh, for example, in Asian regions, they have uh, different uh, understanding of the intervals. You know, like they they have their own distances, and like uh, in Arabs, uh, once again, they have quarter tones, and then the Byzantine traditions was based on twelve um, commas. Uh, but I think that this is the one I just showed you is very it's standard these days for Greek Turkish music. So next, we're going to talk about another drum. It's called the Rek, uh, descended from the Daft drum. And this is a very, very important drum in uh, classical Arabic music. In matter of fact, I have one with me right here. 
And um, uh, even though this has uh, this was part of, big part of the classical Arabic uh, music repertoire, uh, in contemporary Middle Eastern music, it, uh, this drum was adapted to other traditions as well. Like uh, in Greek music, they use it now in in uh, in um, music from Cyprus. It's a it's a beautiful drum and it works very well along with the darbuka. So n these days we hear this drum a lot. Uh, so this this drum uh, originates from Egypt, Syria and Iraq. Uh, it's a type of frame drum, right? And uh, it's made of uh, a wooden frame uh, and a drum head, usually natural skin. This is synthetic, but usually this is made from fish skin. Because it's a smaller size, drum usually we find this with fish skin and it has symbols on it right we call this the zils uh, one 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 more f uh, uh, piece of fact I'm going to share with you is that this uh, type of frame dress was ma mainly uh, um, used uh, traditionally by women and how do we know that because a lot of the artifacts from the Mesopotamia regions Iraq and iconographies and uh, you know paintings depict women playing them and uh, I would say for the majority of the time women you know and uh, one last thing I'm going to mention about this drum before I do the demonstration is that this dates back to uh, around 3000 to 2500 BC so next I'm going to demonstrate uh, what this drum sounds like let's listen Hello friends, the next drum I'm going to be talking to you about today is the drum that we know as a wreck um, and this is mainly uh, associated uh, with classical Arabic music however these days uh, this drum uh, can be found to a lot of more contemporary um, uh, traditional music in the Middle East and Mediterranean regions uh, because it, it's a beautiful drum, it has a fantastic sound and a lot of uh, uh, percussionists adapted this into their playing so these days we'll find this um, uh, drum in music uh, uh, outside Arabic music as well. Uh, what this drum really is, is a frame drum and when we say frame drum we mean a frame of some type of wood and a head, right? And these kinds of drums uh, go back thousands of years. There are actually depictions of women playing these kinds, kinds of drums actually on the pyramids. Uh, so um, this drum has um, symbols on them as we can see right here we have a double set of symbols so each of those uh, sets has two symbols and we call this the zils right zil means symbol in Turkish we have the head of the drum traditionally speaking this would be fishkin however in this case it's synthetic and we have the frame the wooden frame right if you look inside you can see it so I'm going to play a little bit so you can get the uh, this the sound of this drum. I'm going to play a rhythm in ten. This rhythm is called a semi. It's in it's in ten and it's grouped in three, two, two, three. One, two, three. One, two. One, two. One, two, three. So one thing you might have noticed is uh, when I play this drum, I switched positions, right? You can play this drum in close position or and when you go to upright position, then you're using the zils with your left hand. So when I'm in close position, I'm mostly playing on the, uh, of the drum skin. But when I'm in upper, upright position, my left hand is on the cymbals and my right hand plays on the drum. So, and this 
this is a complicated drum to learn, actually much harder than the, uh, the Derbuka, in my opinion, uh, because it uh, involves um, the more positions and also way more uh, advanced strokes. But I'm going to give you the basics, like we talked in the earlier video on Derbuka, we have the doom sound. On this drum, we, because it's a smaller drum, we get the doom si sound by using our ring finger on the, on the head of the drum. We get the tech sound by hitting with our ring finger at the very edge of the drum. And we can do the same thing with the left hand as well. Uh, one thing you might notice is when I'm playing the close sounds, the techs, both of my index fingers are, are, are positioned uh, and muffle the drum. You know, you see with these two fingers, with my index fingers, my right and left index finger, I'm muffling the drum while playing the tech. That way you get a crispy sound. You know, if I open my fingers, you see, the sound has a tail now. And in this music, we want the sound to be crisp. Um, the other sound I'm going to show you is the path. We talked about this on the, on the other Darbuka, and it's very similar on the record, right? We just hit in the middle of the drum with a, a closed tone. And finally, and this is, I'm not going to get into this much because it's a very more advanced thing. Um, when we play upright position, then we can use the zills with our ring fingers, right? So this is the rig. So yeah. Let me make this full screen. All right, there we go. So as we could hear, uh, the rec is one of the uh, more complicated drums, and uh, but it's a, it's a lot of fun. And I, if you ha if you have access to any kind of drum like a type of tambourine, like a, a, a maybe a pandeiro or a kanjira, uh, I recommend you like practicing these positions because um, this is a really fun drum to learn. And uh, I, when I started actually practicing this, at the time I didn't have a rec, so I ended up playing on a pandero for a while. But these zills on the pandero are much smaller and they have one set, but I think you can still do it. And um, the rhythm I was playing, and that I would like to, like to end my workshop with that, and maybe you can, um, if you like to practice in, on whatever instrument you're playing, it's actually a fantastic rhythm, as I said in my, in my presentation of the, the rec. It's called a semai. Arabs call it a semai. In Turkey, they call it aksak semai. But it's the same thing. It's the rhythm is in 10. 1, 2, 3, 1, 2, 1, 2, 1, 2, 3. Doom. Tek. Doom. A tek. A doom. Tek. A doom. Doom. Tek. Tek. That's a nice variation too. Doom. Two, three, tech, doom, doom, tech, two, three, doom, tech, doom, doom, tech, doom, tech, doom, doom, tech, doom, tech, doom, doom, tech, one, two, three, one, two, one, two, one, two, three, one, two, three, one, two, Two, one, two, one. Upright position. So, with this, my friends, I would love to conclude this workshop. Uh, this is a uh, part of three workshops. We're going to meet two more times, and my for the next workshop, we are going to have two fantastic special guests. Uh, world-recognized singer Irene Dornsagi and world-recognized uh, laudo player uh, Vasilis Kostas um, that uh, we're going to talk about uh, uh, the different regions from Greece. But as well, during the next uh, workshop, we're going to start introducing um, some ideas of how to blend these sounds with other genres of music. And Vasilis also will present a nice example of the two of us playing uh, for a jazz concert that I'm incorporating percussion. He is also playing on the traditional instruments. So, and during the last workshop, we're going to be talking even more about that. Uh, you know, we're going to introduce some also traditional instruments, but also we're going to make some connections that are very important. And with this, I'm concluding my workshop. And I think we're going to follow this with a QA. and a It was an honor to be here. Thank you so much. And I'm happy to answer any questions you might have. Thank you.